The Future of Reproducible Research, powered by Kubeflow. For KubeCon and CloudNativeCon Europe 2022. About me. First of all, thank you for coming to my talk. As is customary amongst our people, the second slide is about me and a quick highlight reel of my credentials. My name is Trevor Grant. I am from the Humble Park neighborhood of Chicago. And this background image is this the skyline um, at the top of the Sledding Hill in the park. You get this cool effect when the sun goes down and all the buildings turn orange. At any rate, I thought it was cool. First and foremost, though, I'm the PMC chair of Apache Mahout. And while the not the second most important thing, a fun fact is I'm also on the project mentorship committee of Apache Streams and Apache Community Development. And I'm also a member of Apache SDAP Incubating. All cool projects, please check them out. And from all of this Apache activity, you might have guessed, I'm also an Apache Software Foundation member. But wait, there's more. I'm also author of Kubeflow for Machine Learning from Lab to Production, available from O'Reilly Media. And lastly, since I believe our job shouldn't define us, well, I guess I don't have my jobs listed. Uh, I've got a couple of my hustles uh, there at the bottom. So I think some versions of the schedule still have me listed as working for Ericto, but I am not anymore. They are a very cool company. I have not, nothing but nice things to say about them, but we have parted ways. Now I'm into importing various family and cargo trikes from China via Alibaba to Chicago. Check out the R&D section of my website. Um, there's a post about building your own e-bike or e-trike from a kit. I'm hoping in the next day or two to have a blog about how to rig out lights and a horn kit. Working on dash displays with Raspberry Pis. You can check out the website, the blog, the Redbubble store. But the key thing is I'm doing this to get cars off the road and not to make money. So if you want to partner on something, hit me up. If you want to see all my work and launch the next Tesla of e-bikes, cool. I mean, maybe give me a nice cushy job as an engineering consultant. But mainly I'm just stoked to get greenhouse gases decreasing and cars off the road. So a good question is, how will this relate to Kubeflow? And the answer is it doesn't. But my main hustle the last couple months have been um, this little guy, his stage name is Merlin. And since I don't need any internet rando stealing his identity, let's just say he was born around eight weeks ago. Why am I showing you this? Well, obviously the main reason is to get some oohs and ahs and otherwise endear myself to you, the audience. But also, normally I make jokes with my talks. I took a stand-up class with a friend in early February with the express plan to make jokes, but I didn't get them written um, and I didn't get to test them out at open mic nights. And you might be thinking, what's that? I thought you were just naturally funny. I'm not. I put a lot of work into making funny jokes for my talks. A couple of years ago, I did a talk for OS ODSC East. I had a bang and tight five that went with that talk. Um, and if any of y'all are thinking about doing talks, which you should, doesn't matter what level you're at, all the way from junior dev to C-suite, you should be giving talks. And my best advice is to have five minutes worth of jokes you can do at an open mic and then also do them at local meetups. Okay, at any rate, the point being is I didn't get around to writing any amazing jokes, but well, here's what today's talk's gonna look like. Um, I'm a little over a week late turning in the recording, so some to do slipped in production, like me coming up with a fun new title for this slide. And also you might've noticed that I didn't realize stylize this deck very much, but okay. Um, but the overview of today's talk, we're just finishing the introduction now. Next we'll lay out some motivation on why all this content is important um, through clever use of memes and Wikipedia articles. We'll provide an example of a pipeline we published for an article in a peer-reviewed journal. And then I'll berate you with some calls to action and possibly we'll have time for conclusions and Q&As. But one thing I know that I am horrible at is estimating time. So I would guess there will either be no time at the end or there'll be way too much time. There's only one way to find out by staying tuned. Also, I should be in a chat room that you'll have access to answering questions. So don't feel compelled to wait till the end. So, motivation. Uh, 
hilarious article. If you can click the link, I'm not really sure how all of this will work. I think the slides will be available somewhere too. Um, this Jeff Lee person said, new methods and analysis without software are just paperware. And I love that. But now let's uh, progress on to memes. So in theory, you're already motivated by this topic as a KuCon attendee since you've passed up so many other high quality talks to see this one. Or as an internet rando, you found this on YouTube, but since you're watching this instead of practicing accordion or whatever other fun thing you could be doing. But in the spirit of compelling, telling a compelling story, I'm still gonna lay out some motivation in internet meme form. Here's our first meme. The, so we see here a simple, a simple Google image search for reproducible research memes will indicate how serious of a problem the lack of reproducibility is. Or if you like to commune, consume information via journal articles as opposed to internet memes, here are some other articles I've stumbled across to illustrate my point. Note the Wikipedia one doesn't count. However, what I will be doing is using the Wiki, Wikipedia article as a framework for a high level overview of the problem. So the replication crisis, what is it? To save you having to go and read the Wikipedia page, let me give you a quick summary. Uh, it's super useful as the problem of reproducibility is larger than the remedy that Kubeflow provides. Psychology and medicine have the biggest problems with reproducibility, but other social and natural sciences are also affected. Um, we'll talk about meta-science in a few slides, but the punchline being, if, you're, if you aren't convinced this is an issue, you can Google replication crisis and see tens, thousands, tens of thousands of articles, videos, blogs, and memes about why it is. So first let's talk about some of the causes and why we have the crisis. Um, again, base, basing a lot of this on the Wikipedia article, but the commodification of science, what does that mean? Phil Murawski argues in his 2011 book, Science Smart, that science is for sale in a market like other goods and it has commodified. Quality assurances have collapsed. And that is to say that pr as private companies push to fund science, they're really not investing enough in their QA practices. But it's not just capitalism driving bad science. Academia, which is notoriously insulated from capitalistic pressures, still pushes faculty to publish or perish. That is, publish papers or look for a new job. And there is publication bias against reproducing prior work, which is probably why grad students end up gets, getting stuck doing it. More on this later. Then there is the case of straight up fraud and deception. This includes researchers not being blinded to the control versus experimental groups, as well as cherry picking your results and all the other things that lost you points in high school. But most hilariously, there was a survey done among 2000 psychologists in 2012, where 90% of the respondents admitted to using at least one questionable research practice in a published work. But, and this is the hilarious part, the survey itself used some questionable practices. So take the whole thing with a grain of salt. Or that's really the gold standard of making my point that even studies about questionable research end up using questionable practices. Then there are statistical issues. Uh, when I was in grad school, I had a part-time job tutoring at the local community college. For a statistics class being taught there, the professor had students attempt to reproduce uh, results from some study. This girl came in, she was working on an article related to uh, physical therapy, since that was the field she wanted to get into. She was having a hard time getting the answers the author came up with. To short circuit a long story, which I've forgotten the, a lot of the finer details of anyway, the girl couldn't replicate because she was using the correct standard deviation formula and the authors had used the wrong one, the population one, in their uh, work. And since their results would have been significant either way, I don't think they were being fraudulent. I think they were just bad at statistics. Uh, other times statistics can cause issues where there's only a handful of people being studied. It creates an issue called low power, where even if an effect is there, you won't see it since you don't have enough people or subjects to look at. And then you also have base rate hypothesis accuracy, which was a new one on me, but it makes a lot of sense. Figure someone failed to reject a null hypothesis at 95% confidence interval. Well, there's still a one in 20 chance. That was just a luck of the draw of the test subjects. 
that's why also why your statistics teacher always hard that you never prove anything with statistics you just fail to disprove also known as failing to reject the null hypothesis but we grow up and we forget these little bits of uh, semantic pearls of wisdom so the primary consequence of concern when someone produces an incorrect result is and no one detects it is that there's a risk that the incorrect result will be canonized and other results will be built upon it but there are other consequences too um insofar as political repercussions i can speak more to the issue in us than europe but anecdotally it's common among climate change deniers tobacco and automotive lobbyists and others the way this story goes through political repercussions is there's legitimate there is a legitimate reproducibility crisis but some actors will exploit the crisis and say for instance that a study from the 60s and 70s that showing car pollution was a primary cause of acid rain and the data sets no longer available ergo the study can't be reproduced ergo it's invalid ergo car pollution doesn't really cause acid rain and never did i think you can see some of the logical missteps there but that's the short version of it but politicians in theory in a republic are supposed to mirror the concerns of their citizens so in a very tangential thread we also see consequences in public opinion and perceptions which in turn also affect policy someone starts crowdsourcing how about how a, or i'm sorry someone starts crowing about a study showing that the sky is blue can't be replicated so people start thinking that the sky isn't really blue then the sky isn't blue spreads all over twitter and facebook and 24-hour news cycles pick it up with some networks claiming that science has proven the sky isn't blue and other networks claiming how the sky is always blue and clouds and nighttime don't exist and anyone who disagrees or thinks otherwise is a long list of mean words things really spin out of hand we see this play out unfortunately almost weekly it seems anymore but the name calling doesn't stop with the talking heads on cnn and fox news the replication crisis gained the most attention in psychology a professor from princeton said anyone that calls out research that can't be replicated is a methodological terrorist and that criticism should only be expressed in private or by contacting the journals directly in essence her response to a serious issue in her field was to start crowing about how no one should talk about the issue which i mean is a solution but not a great one so according to this wikipedia page there are four major buckets for potential remedies the first bucket uh is reforms in publishing remedies in this bucket include meta science which is study the study of science itself um presentation of methodology not just the results our solution kind of fits along those lines um results blind peer reviews and pre-registration of studies that is to say how you explain and how you're setting up your experiment and then the journal says yes or no to publishing the results before you actually have done the experiment and then and finally some folks suggest using something like google google scholar to track how often studies have been replicated and what the results of the replication are the next bucket is statistical reform which includes using smaller p-values um so let's going back to the odds of at the five percent confidence interval you have a one in 20 chance of just randomly selecting people that will show that uh, that effect exists when it doesn't so they're saying okay well then instead of the five percent being the gold standard the one percent should be the gold standard and that would make it so there's only one in 100 chance of just seeing results by chance another remedy would be to do away with p values altogether and also words like significant and non-significant since most folks don't really remember their stats one one course or what those words mean and finally the last statistical reform mentioned would be to use larger sample sizes which is always a good goal for us and there's probably a lot of big data users in here so it's usually not much of an issue but there it is for a complete report uh the replication effort remedies in essence call for more funding of replication studies for students to be required to do more replication studies i remember having to do replication studies in grad school it was not fun for many reasons which i will espouse later in the talk i.e the authors usually didn't fully specify what their data prep steps were or maybe they didn't do qa on their own experiment or their data is private 
and it would be too costly or impossible to reproduce the data set. The solution there is to involve the original author. And when the original author is involved with a replication attempt, they're successful about 91% of the time compared with 65% when the author isn't involved. And the final bucket is a bit more meta, changes to the scientific approach. The first thing in this bucket is called, they say, use triangulation, not reproducibility. And it's a good option. The idea is if X is true, we should be able to demonstrate X in a number of ways. In case of research then, if some other research asserts X is true, instead of trying to reproduce their result or their research, you should find some other method for testing whether X is true. Another remedy in this bucket is to stop using linear models for everything. The reality of the situation is not everything has a linear relationship and researchers should feel more free to try and use other models besides linear regression. I'm guessing a lot of folks in this crowd would agree with that. Then there is uh, the remedy, especially related to publication bias, that replication should seek to revise and extend current theories, not merely replicate them. For instance, if you replicate a well-known study, but then you also add an interesting finding, that would be a more publishable paper than simply four pages of saying, yep, it worked the way the original person said it did. And finally, the remedy most, cli most closely aligned to our proposed remedy, open science. Open science is sort of an umbrella term around open data, publishing your code again, and other things. We're expanding that and saying, don't just publish your code, but publish your full pipeline. Now a slide based on my experience trying to repo reproduce other people's work so everything doesn't come straight off a Wikipedia article I read. Um, as a grad student, I remember reproducing academic papers. The authors always seemed to leave out entirely any of the data prep they did, or they would try to confuse you with lots of formulas. And candidly, I did a lot of that too when I was doing working on my MBA. If I didn't have time to do enough research, I just put a lot of scary math in the middle and hoped the professor wouldn't check my math and the MBA professors rarely did, so it worked. Now, I'm not sure if this audience is more academic or business oriented, and I feel like the uh, wiki page mainly addressed the academic nature of the problem, but other reproducibility issues that I hit in the wild are normally when other programmers either throw something the fence to me or something that, um, or they left a long, long time ago and I have to dig around in their own mess. But the programmer who I loathe most of all, the one who's the worst about throwing trash over the fence to be sorted out, is past Trevor. Me from the future hates the me of today, just like I loathe Trevor of 2019, but especially when I open up some code that Trevor of 19 was working on and spend three days trying to figure out what the hell he did and why. I recently ran in, I recently had another run in with past Trevor, which I will use as an illustrative example in this. Now, Oh, what we did. So I'm going to give a short version of this talk, but if you're in Valencia, definitely head over on Wednesday to see Holden Caro give the full version of this talk. Um, it's also chapter nine in a book that I'll be plugging later on and a peer reviewed article, which I'll also be plugging later on. So here's the elevator pitch uh, of the summary I'm about to give. I'm putting this up as I'm going to speak fast and I think there are some probably a lot of non-native English speakers here, so this will save you having to mess with the playback speed controls. The short of this is in the early days of the pandemic, everyone was scared. There were no solutions and no solutions were out of bounds. Various emergency rooms turned to CT scans and ultrasounds to detect uh, ground glass occlusions, which was a hallmark of COVID. The technique had been used in ERs in the past for rapid pneumonia detection. CT scans deliver high doses of radiation. Low dose CT scans deliver lower doses of radiation, but they produce noisy images. We use Kubernetes, Apache Spark, Apache Mahout, and Kubeflow to denoise these CT scans. So, March 2020, people are dying. Spain, Italy, and New York, hospitals are being overrun with COVID. Now, you can see the here the dates, or maybe you can't really see it, but the date was March 28th, 2020. This guy is wearing plastic wraps with some sort of cootie, cootie shield. Looks silly now, but it was scary back then. Nobody really knew what was going on. Nobody knew. Um, yeah. Not everyone had COVID. It took a long time to get a test results back. 
This was another one from March 28th of 2020. PCR tests take three days to return. People were trying to come up with rapid tests, but we see from March 26th, 2020, only detecting 60% of true positives at the time was considered promising. These weren't even widely available yet. They were like coming soon teasers. We kind of take for granted that you can just get a 15 minute test now, but like that wasn't the case in the 2020s. Um, and But that was compounding the issues with hospitals being overrun because everyone who comes to the hospital thinking they have COVID doesn't actually have COVID, but you had to sit there for three days waiting for your test to come back. Here we see something from March 23rd. Um, creativity and creativity in finding new ways to rapidly detect COVID with equipment already available at the hospital was at a premium. This article refers to doctors at some of the early hotspots of Italy and Spain using ultrasound to check for uh, check lungs quicker than a PCR test could come back. More on why CT scans are great or at least people were thinking they were, especially back in the early days of COVID. But CT scans have issues. Um, the biggest ones being the radiation that they hit. Uh, a, typical, a thoracic CT scan, which is a CT scan of your chest region, which is how they would diagnose COVID, gives you about 6.1 millisieverts of radiation. There's a chart to put that in perspective. It's not horrible, but it's pretty high for a diagnostic procedure. Um, and another metric to put it in perspective, over the course of your entire life, you're really only supposed to get about 400 millisieverts of radiation. So, yeah. Now, low dose CT scans have been around since the 90s um, and early aughts, and they were developed for diagnostics, explicitly for uh, detecting lung cancer or early lung cancer. A lower, they'll give about 1.4 millisieverts of radiation. However, the trade-off that lower radiation dose is you end up with a noisier um, image. And when I'm talking about noise here, think of if you grew up and you had an antenna, like the static on a TV channel, or if you had cable and there were channels your parents didn't pay for, then kind of, yeah, just static on TV channels. So now to denoise images, um, the methods were being developed in parallel with the low dose CT scan technique to do some hand waving. The way you denoise a, a CT scan is basically the same method as you doing a principal component analysis. However, if you have ever done a lot of work with principal component analysis, you have to do a matrix inversion. Um, and again, I'm trying to just go fast here, but I did. I tried doing it with Numpy just for fun, and it threw an at uh, warning saying it would need 500 gigabytes of RAM. Now you can get computers with 500 gigabytes of RAM, but they're kind of pricey to rent, and we're wizards of open source, so let's do something else. Now the data source uh, that I used was there was this Brazilian uh, radiologist who got CT scans from 10 patients from Wuhan, China, posted them coronacases.org. Since then, they have messed with the metadata, so you can't pull these these images anymore. You can see them at coronacases.org, but if you try to download them, they don't work right anymore, So, or at least in my experience. But that's a ground glass occlusion, that I think. I'm not a radiologist, so let me also be very upfront about that. Uh, so why was it critical to use open source to this? I doubt I have to sell this too hard to this audience, but we didn't even realize how much the socioeconomic uh, disparities were going to affect Sub-Saharan Africa and other poor areas of the world. We see here from a headline from January 21st, January of 2021 in the Wall Street Journal, how COVID-19 has widened the gap between rich and poor countries. Open source software can um, level the playing field. It can be distributed much more quickly than proprietary software don't really have time to soapbox this out completely, but I hope you understand why and when and how free and open source software is great. So the pipeline, the gist of what happens here, S3 buckets have DICOM images, um, PyDICOM downloads, or I'm sorry, the, S, the DICOMs are loaded onto a uh, persistent volume claim, PyDICOM 
turns them into a numerical matrix, which is loaded into Spark and loaded into an RDD, which is then wrapped by Mahout DRM. The reason we're using Mahout, we'll talk about in a bit later. Um, Mahout has a distributed stochastic singular value decomposition, which in essence allows us to invert the matrix and get two matrices out, which allows us to do our denoising. S3 buckets, we know what they are. The main reason for this is um, on at least Google's Kubernetes instance, I believe for sure when it was written, I believe still is the case. You don't have um, read write many options on persistent volume claims. And I'm gonna assume that since it's a KubeCon and everyone here is somewhat familiar with um, Kubernetes, you know what that means. Spark, when it's writing, it's gonna be writing from every executor. So you have to have an S3 bucket to read and write from. And that's why we use the S3 buckets. You do take a performance hit when you're using S3 buckets, just as a note. But if you've got to use Spark, that's usually a good solution if you're not running on your own private Kubernetes cluster or Kubernetes cluster in general that does not support read write many. So I'm gonna take a big breath and start going a lot faster because I realize I'm not tracking well on time. Um, PyDICOM, great for reading an easy manipulation of DICOM images. That's a Python library. Apache Spark, um, a great distributed um, engine, requires a resource op to run in Kubernetes. There can be a, a number of fun and unique challenges about doing um, Spark on Kubernetes. I'll let you figure that out in your own adventure. Mahout is a library that goes on top of Spark. Spark's support for matrices, it does have matrix support, but not distributed matrix support. And Mahout does have distributed matrix support and I'm a maintainer of Mahout. So of course I wanted to rope that into this, into my talk and my book and my journal article and everything else. So there we go. Um, distributed singular value, de a distributed stochastic singular value decomposition. Blah. Nathan Halko uh, wrote a thesis on this a few years ago. It um, it allows you to distribute a singular value decomposition, which was important for what we were trying to do. And there's some cool graphics about it. Um, so visualizing the results. To be clear, I don't think that these were low dose CT scans to begin with. Really what this is showing more than anything is that if you over denoise, you begin to like, as you can see in image D at the bottom right corner, you start to lose signal as well as noise. Um, but yeah, so that's that. Um, the, a, a big point of this is if you want to know how to do this with Kubeflow, that's a chapter nine example in the book that some friends and I wrote. If you want to read the article about why I was doing all these things, it's free and open article um, on Noble Research. Feel free to check it out. And yeah. So, and once again, or if you just want to see the talk, go check out uh, Holden's talk on, at, on Wednesday at 1725 if you're in Valencia, or I'm sure it'll exist somewhere on this YouTube channel as well. I, yeah. Okay, so what? When I was working at Ericto, I dusted off the old code and made sure it still worked. It does. Um, one issue that I hit was the data set had changed, but, but as I was talking about earlier, the metadata DICOMs didn't load right. Um, however, you can put any DICOM image in an S3 bucket, aim it, and it should run. Um, and clean them if needed. So let's say that you have some, uh, but here's another thing. Let's say you have some deep learning that you wanted to use to detect COVID. Cool, with Kubeflow, you can just add a step at the end that does that. But what if you wanted to detect lung cancer? Cool, you can just add a step at the end with that. What if you're a hospital that like given a low dose CT scan, you wanna check for COVID and lung cancer and tuberculosis? You can just add three steps at the end. And what if you have an idea and you want to see if denoising helps neural nets detect some sort of malady? You can feed an arbitrary image, have your algorithm look for the malady at the raw DICOM, and then again on a denoise DICOM. The point being, since I published a pipeline, you could spend your time extending my results as opposed to trying to figure out how the heck my code ever worked in the first place. 
So, calls to action. Uh, assume replication. So, assume someone, somewhere, someday, possibly you, will need to replicate your study. Be a cool person and help them by documenting all the steps in your paper. That would be, that's one call to action. Um, and you might say, well, that's why I published my code. And I would say, okay, cool. And if this were an academic conference, I let it go at that. But by virtue of the fact that you're at KubeCon, I'm going to assume A, that you get this joke and B, that by extension, understand why publishing code isn't enough. In case you don't, let me very explicitly lay out some reasons. The environment being the environment being different. Um, perhaps whatever package you use to calculate standard deviation was doing it wrong, or worse yet, what if they fix it later? Or what if it used to be correct, but then some regression was introduced? The point being as software is all living, um, not documents, but it's a living thing and it can change over time. You can set a seed. How many people actually remember to do this before using deterministic stochastic processes? Can uh, also check out, just Google low background steel. This is wild um, and will make you forever doubt the accuracy of any of your analysis ever. So maybe don't look it up, but low background steel, cool stuff and a good reason of why sometimes computers don't work the way you would hope they would. So I touched on this in the comic in the last slide, but your laptop environment is like a snowflake. It's very special and unique like the billions of other laptops or snowflakes. No one will ever create another environment quite the same ever again. So instead of using just requirements.txt and calling it a day, make a Docker container, which will also version lock. In addition to breaking changes that might be introduced between TensorFlow 1.4 and 2.0, there's also a thousand little things that happen in the background of your computer. What version of CUDA drivers are you running? What version and flavor of Linux are you running? Etc. Etc. So Docker containers help make your code a lot more reproducible. Assuming someone will want to replicate your work and that they don't have access to your machine, Kubeflow provides a nice framework for reproducing results. Now, that said, what is Kubeflow and how will it help? From the website, Kubeflow, the Kubeflow project is dedicated to making deployments of machine learning workflows on Kubernetes simple, portable, and scalable. Our goal is not to recreate other services, but to provide a straightforward way to deploy best of breed open source systems for ML to diverse infrastructures. Anywhere you are running Kubernetes, you should be able to run Kubeflow. So if you're using Kubeflow just for doing reproducible research, it's probably a bit overkill candidly. Kubeflow does model serving, you can bolt on feature stores, metadata tracking, and a host of other things. But if your goal is just for re re reproducing research, you probably won't need all that. However, it is easily deployable on various cloud providers, so there may be some uh, value add there. And again, I am no longer associated with Ricto, but they have a cloud deployment that runs for about 50, an 50 cents an hour, or you can use Ubuntu's uh, Charm Kubeflow. Those are gonna be probably your two easiest ways to get Kubeflow up and running. And then the pipeline itself, you can just download as a zip file and publish also to Git repository. So this advice was earned over an untold number of hours trying to do Kubeflow installs. It's a, it can be a very painful process and your time's probably best spent. If you've got the 50 cent, if you've got a three bucks just to fire up Kubeflow and take all your code and put it into a pipeline, it's probably gonna be your best way to go about it. And I would strongly recommend that because you have better things to do than install Kubeflow. So shake out your couch for a few dollars and change and just get it set up. And I'm saying that with no kickbacks from anyone. So in conclusion, reproducibility is a cornerstone of science. So do everyone else a favor and make your sciencing uber reproducible. For more information on Kubeflow, obviously you should buy our book. We make tens, tens of cents on, for each copy sold. Um, also check out the paper and if you feel like doing some cool stuff with um, DICOM images. You can extend my research and cite me and I don't get paid for that either, but it makes me feel happy. And if you're trying to reproduce my work, as we said earlier, things are much more reproducible when the original author is involved, 
or if you just want to chat about something else, or if you are really into electric bikes and trikes and want to do some cool stuff with that, or if you just need more friends on LinkedIn, whatever, that's cool. There's how you can get a hold of me. Um, and I should have been available in the chat this entire time for Q&A and hopefully people had questions and I've been answering them and yeah. So thanks again for coming to my talk and I think I actually nailed this perfect on time. So great. Have a good one and thanks again.